do you know what a yellow-bellied sapsucker is? I think W.C. Fields used to use that as a kind of description of a coward or something. I can't remember, but anyway, there is such a bird. Looks like a woodpecker, but it's actually listed in the books as a yellow-bellied sapsucker. And uh, we get this friend coming every year and it drills holes in the maple tree by the bell. Really neat little holes, very engineered. And then it drinks the sap and I think it, I guess it eats the insects that get collected in there. But here's the thing. And then the squirrels know, well, this is the fun part. The squirrels know, hey, this, this is gonna be great. So they go up and they, they hug this tree and they get absolutely drunk <laughs> on maple syrup. It's, anyway, it's quite fun. So that's the birding story. But what more important here is that the, <laughs> the excavation of our new Dharma home is starting. Is that better, Siri Mato? Is that more <laughs> to your liking? Uh, after what, how many years? Five, six years we've been planning this. Finally, uh, we're in the construction uh, phase. So it's kind of, a bubbly day for us, sort of a whoopee, it's happening. And these chaps have big machines and they've dug about, what, what would you say the, the dimensions of the hole would be? Would be 100 feet? Uh, 80 feet, 90 feet by, yeah, 90 feet by 20. 100 feet by 20, is that all? Anyway, it's a big hole. <laughs> uh, anyway, it has to be seven feet deep, and they've hit bedrock and all the rest of it. So, so it's uh, it's a very exciting time for us, and we hope to have a closed-in building by December. That won't be usable, uh, but it'll be closed in for the elements, and that's what we're shooting for. So it's a, it's a really it's been a really wonderful day, sunny day, and so on. Um, Actually, I'd like to go back to that reading I did with Bita on the last meeting with her. I just find it really excellent sort of summation of the, of the different aspects of Buddhism that we could consider. So this is from Mechi Bunyu. Mechi is nun in the Thai tradition. So she was one of the senior nuns, one of the most accomplished nuns with Achan Cha. She's passed away since. And she was there for, for several decades, I think. And this was her summation of, of, of Lumpa Cha's teaching when he came to the, the nun section of Wapakom, the monastery. When he came to give a talk, if there were a lot of newly ordained Mechis present, he'd speak on a basic level, but not arguing or contending, knowing the meaning of the precepts. On the intermediary level, he talked about training to abandon greed, hatred, and delusion, attachment to views and conceit, how to practice once our precepts were purely kept. On the highest level, he talked about what you'd see and what you'd experience when you practiced. He talked about the purpose of becoming a nun, about the highest goal of a monastic's life. He would talk about Nibbana and Anatta, and there being nothing worth attaching to. Sometimes he might ask an old Mechi, do you know what the state of your mind will be at the point of death? He taught us to know the knowing in the knowing, not the knowing of heat and cold, of pleasure and pain, of day and night, but the knowing in the knowing. The last sentence again, he taught us to know the knowing in the knowing. Not the knowing of heat and cold, of pleasure and pain, of day and night, but the knowing in the knowing. That's very Zen or whatever you want. And, and that last bit is, I think, what I would say is the idea of transcendence, which is obviously an idea I not just an idea, 
but actually an aspiration that's interested me because I've been in this business for a long time. Um, but the first part where she said, where they just learn to live together is a huge part of our discussion as spiritual practitioners. It might be about the rule of law or um, truth and reconciliation for the indigenous communities. Uh, it might be about the quality of our water. It might be about helping refugees that have to come out of Ukraine. And so there's so many other things on that social level that we could talk about. Um, but I'm sure you, you do talk about all those things and you're all committed in your own ways to the well-being of your society and, and the well-being of your land and trees. So I feel that that's pretty much covered. It's, the problems are insoluble, really. And yet we have to solve them. We have to work as human beings to make things as better as we can. And yet there always, there's always been conflict. There's always been stupidity, cruelty. These things are just a part of our, our um, troubled humanity. It doesn't mean we give up. We give to it all we can. And there are so many forums and ways of, of, of talking about that. As you know, I always have always thought, well, I just try to be a person locally that tries to do good things. So building this Dharma Hall is actually very inspiring in the time of war, Tigray or Ukraine or the repression in Myanmar, all these, it's just a whole endless list of these, these horrors. And it's, it's actually very inspiring to be involved in a creation of something which is peaceful. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm very happy to be able to do that and then to offer that to a, to a community doesn't solve all the problems of the world, not even close to it, but it's something, you know, it's, it, it has some effect. And I think if we, if for each of us, we want to do something and I think it is important to do something if we have the physical capacity and the resources to do so, um, but within our means, with, within, uh, within a, a kind of a possibility that we might have. And so compassion is, is, is is the, the motivation for doing good in the world, but compassion isn't trying necessarily, it's not trying to fix everything, because that is of course very depressing. You can't fix everything. We know that logically, but sometimes we overreach and think that we uh, should do more or, or, or we can fix more. And so we feel perhaps hopeless or desperate, but I, I, because it is so desperate, all these things. And yet we can do small things and, and commit our, resources and energies to small and meaningful things. And that really helps the heart because it's the activation of compassion. The other, the worrying and, 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 and the frightfulness of it all and the despair of it all is not really compassion. Um, it's despair and that, you know, where that goes. So I don't really have any answers to those things, uh, but I do try to, you know, to do my little bit in the world. Uh, and then the other, the second part about greed, hatred, and delusion, that's really the emotional part of our life, that, that we're, you know, our, our inner world is created through our interaction with the outer. And, and then we respond to the outer, and there is this sort of give and take. And the inner becomes also the memory patterns and all the structures that our, uh, our personality gets built on and uh, all of that. And, and that's terribly important, the psychological part, the understanding of our conditioning, uh, the understanding how the sense of self arises and persists and, and does all kinds of um, unfortunate things and causes us suffering. Um, but but if, we, if we, we were to leave uh, the spiritual life just at the psychological level, not to dismiss it, it's actually a very necessary stepping stone to, to, to freedom. We have to address them. If we don't address our emotional life, we don't understand it, then it will rule us in ways which would be very destructive. But um, the, the Buddhist teaching is pointing to something really quite ineffable, quite hard to, to, to understand because you can't really reach it with thought. And yet right thinking is a part of the Buddhist practice. Right thinking as, as a kind of an indicator of which way to go. Uh, right thinking as an aspiration, right thinking as uh, analyzing this or that. But the ultimate answer 
the ultimate freedom of human consciousness is not a thought. So putting, I think putting that into perspective, what is the usefulness of thought, what is right thought in Buddhism um, is, is so very, very important because I think all of us are probably overeducated, maybe not overeducated, uh, but we are, you know, we have a lot of concepts that we, that we uh, are uh, imbued with. And in re reading Ajahn Chah's biography, you know, he would often say that the Westerners that came to him just had much more complex thinking minds because they had a much more kind of uh, complex structures of, of, of analysis and such like. And, and so the Me Mechi Bunyu's last statement, uh, know the knowing in the knowing, is, is, is you can't, if you try to figure that out, that'll just take you to thought. And this is where, 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 where we're challenged by our, our sense that we understand Buddhism. Because if you understand Buddhism intellectually, great. But quite often, if it's just that, it's just left as an intellectual position, it's not really freedom. Because it's simply an opinion, a good opinion, a valid opinion. But surely Buddhism or, or freedom or spirituality, whatever you don't have to call Buddhism, is more than just a set of dogmatic thoughts however good they are. So the thoughts and the ideas of Buddhism are pointing to something, not even something, but a way of being. It's hard to explain. So in, 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 um, in the contemplative life, what we're doing with thought is, is we're, not just, we're not just reaching for answers through thought, but we're using thought to bring us to silence. And that is silence is very difficult. I think you'll all agree. If you look at what the activity of your consciousness was for this day, how much of it was the mind being preoccupied with thinking? A lot, right? And yet you look back and how much of that was necessary and how much was just habit, the compulsion of habit. So the, the, use, of, the use of thought as an awakening factor or, or, or an, uh, an enlightening factor or something that brings you to silence is a different use of thought. So when I, when I, when I suggest that uh, just in this little meditation, I said, just feel your body and then know that you know. And that's very, very simple. Now, if you are very much into thinking and you're trying to figure out what does he mean by know the knowing, you'll be in thought, won't you? You'll just be thinking, and then where does that fit in this text? And you know, where is that in front of, and you'll just be thinking. So a, a lot of, I should think that a lot of times we are listening to Dhamma talks, with, we're kind of analyzing and thinking to ourselves. But this kind of talk where you, where Mechi Bunyu says, uh, not the knowing of good and bad, or light and dark, or day and night, but knowing the knowing, know that you know. That's hard to, it's very easy, but it's very hard. And like I always say, it's, it's kind of like getting the punchline of the joke. You either get it or you don't. And, and what would you need to do that, to know the knowing? Well, you have to, like, if, I, if I'm, I'm looking at the Buddha image, and, and if I make the Buddha image most important, that it's, uh, it's got gold leaf on it, it's, it's of a certain time period, uh, it's aesthetically this way, and I, I don't like it, or I do like it, or that's all analysis and thought, very good. So there, my attention is making the object most important. But I can do it another way. This is like, I often talk about this, I think it's the only thing I talk about. <laughs> but I can also, look at the Buddha Rupa as a visual perception and not go to the perception created by thought and time and history and memory, but just allow the image to present itself. Just love, and, and the way I say that is let the image come to me. Just let the image be in consciousness. Now, when I do that, what is param, what's important now is not the 
aesthetic quality of the Buddha image, but it's rather the knowing. So I'm emphasizing the knowing. And then I can say to myself, I know that I know. I know presence. I know that I'm here now, whatever way you want to phrase that. If you say to me then, well, what do you know? Well, I know that I know. Well, is it big? It's not a quality. It's not a quality. I could say, like, I've had some a pinched nerve in my hip today. So I could say, yeah, I know I have a pinched nerve in my hip. But it's not, like Minchi Bunya is saying, it's not about knowing hot and cold. That's obvious. We know hot and cold. But knowing that you know, knowing that knowing presence. You say, well, what's presence? Well, what is it? It's like, what is the most obvious thing right now for all of us, whatever our experience is, whether you're hot, or cold, or male or female, or what, what is the most obvious thing right now? If you, if you just stop thinking, and what's the most obvious thing? Well, being or presence, or consciousness, or knowing. Isn't that, isn't that the most, you know, it, it's, it's always there. Go to, go to the room next to you. Go to the kitchen, sit down in the kitchen, be in the kitchen. What's the most obvious thing? Or well, the color of the kitchen? Well, yeah, yeah, it changed. But what didn't change? Did beingness or presence or, or, or knowing what, whatever language you like, consciousness, did that really change when you went to the kitchen? The, the, the qualities of the environment changed, yeah. And, and so the, the desire moment and the mind which is taken up by objects um, always refers to the quality of objects, to the quantity of objects, to the aesthetics of objects, to the painfulness of objects, be they mental objects or physical objects, whatever. And, and much of our life, we have to do that. Like, I hope the diggers pay attention to the objects called rocks and buildings and don't knock it all down. So I'm not saying that we live in some kind of la-la land where we don't notice things. No, that's why the first two parts of Buddhism, the social life and the inner life, are the objects that we need to sort out. You know, we need to try as much as possible to live in friendship and conviviality with compassion and generosity. And then our inner world, we need to not figure out how not to get caught up with the objects called emotions and memories and that big part of the world. And, and, and that is, that's the foundation for this ineffable consideration of, well, what doesn't change? And obviously, because I've been a monk for a long time, that consideration is paramount for me that if, if I were to be to give you a talk uh, 40 years ago, I would be talking about the raging fears I was feeling or, or how bored I was with monasticism and so on. So I've obviously worked through that. But, but I've always been interested in, 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 in awareness itself. And, 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 and to me, to turn attention from the fascination with the objective world or the disgust with it or the, or the absorption into it or obsession with it, all of that is an outward movement. It was outward into qualities, into memories. This is not an outward, it's not a movement at all. It's more like a recognition that irrespective of the color of the wall, of the number of people in this room, irrespective of whether the lights are on or off, whether I go outside or I'm inside, all those different changes, being, presence, knowing, is always there, it's never absent, and it's unchanging. Now, you, you might disagree. Well, that's what I hope. I hope you'll check it out. <laughs> check it out. Like, even when you are absent-minded, you say you're absent-minded, was the presence ever not there? And I talk a lot about this because in meditation, when people, it took me a long time to see this, that when, when, when we're meditating, we have a kind of idea that meditation is not having thought. 
And so then when we are involved in thinking, somehow something comes up and so says, you're thinking too much, or I got lost in thought. And, I, and the question I put to people is, is that true? Were you ever absent? Was presence ever absent? Is that true? Check it out. And I, I would think presence was there when thinking was there. And, and once you start to, to emphasize that meditation is not just the mind, which is free from thought or free from emotion or, or, or free from anything, really, that it is the knowing of thought, of emotion, of feeling, of color, of light, of sound, then it really doesn't matter whether you feel really awful or you feel great. Desire, yeah, desire wants to feel great. Then I want to feel great. So if I have a sore head, the desire doesn't like that. Sure, that's how desire works. It's there to try to make us comfortable as much as possible. But is, is the desire for objects ever going to fulfill us? And by objects, I don't mean just aesthetic objects, emotions or whatever. Is that ever going to fulfill us? Well, from what I see of the teaching, all objects are contingent. The emotions I have, all the feelings I have, all of that is contingent and dependent. Uh, its origin is depending on all kinds of other things. And so if I think that the fulfillment of the desire is getting what I want, then I'm looking in the wrong place. But if I see that actually where the heart is really free is in the cessation of desire. Now, how do you, what is the cessation of desire? Well, I get what I want. Then the desire will be ended. But that doesn't work that way, does it? You know, you get, you get the new computer and the photo app doesn't work. Or something like that. I get, someone gave me this fantastic computer and now all the photos are kaput. I don't know what I did. So there you go. Oh uh, yeah, like if, you know, I get this new my my computer blew up. So so we get this new computer, you know, life will be really happy. We, we know it. it's not gonna be. And 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 so the desire mind fools us into thinking that if I keep rearranging all these objects in some kind of a perfect way, then it'll be okay. Well, we have to use desire. We need to turn on the heat in the mixer and we need to feed the body, so there's nothing wrong with desire. But as a possibility for freedom, can, can the pursuit of desire ever bring us freedom? I would say no, because desire is about objects. Objects are changing and, and, and their instability always means that you reach a point of disappointment. So rather than throw the computer out, try to fix it, do well by it, but see that the realm of desire is not the realm of freedom. The realm of desire is just living skillfully in the world. What is the realm of freedom? And when I, when, I, when I look at the Buddha image and I just allow the Buddha image to come up just as it is, that's non-desire. I don't want the Buddha to be anything. It's easy. It's easy with the Buddha. It's neutral. With a sore hip, it's a bit more difficult. With a really anguished emotion, it's even more difficult. That's obviously very, very true because the more anguish we have, or the more physical pain we have, the harder it is to accept and know this as a condition in awareness because we want to get rid of it. And that's natural. And sometimes like people will like, I'll, 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 I'll talk with people and, and the, the suffering they go through is so, so, so profoundly difficult. And I just think, how do you do it? I have a friend that wrote to me from, BC and is going through so much pain and I just, you know, I want to cry it's such, it's so difficult. And, and I think what's very, very important is, is to, to, to do the best we can for these bodies and our societies, but to see the importance of finding a refuge which is not physical or emotional or, or situational or environmental. And that is to know that you know. Now, if you, if you begin to just play with that idea, and I play with that idea a lot with different kinds of ideas, 
So, you, you know, like I'll, you've heard me maybe say, I'll say like awareness. You're just sitting in meditation, awareness. Has awareness got a center? Does awareness have an outer edge? Now, that kind of question, if you, if you try to get an answer to it, well, yeah, it isn't me. I'm the center. That's just thought. It's not awareness. But to pose that kind of a question, you have to observe awareness itself. And when you observe awareness itself, as Mechi Bunyu is saying, know the knowing, it always takes you to silence because there's nothing beyond that. You can't get further than that. And this kind of questioning, which brings you to silence, becomes a, what is it? It, it I don't know what it, it's like, it's not a hobby. <laughs> not quite that. It, it, it's, it's a part, it's kind of a curiosity coming from the Buddha's words that there is the unconditioned, the uncreated, the unoriginated, the unborn. There is Nibbana. There is an end to suffering here and now, not a matter of time. And it comes from that kind of understanding of the transcendent part of Buddhism rather than the uh, psychological part of Buddhism and, 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 and the curiosity to inquire into this moment, this moment, what is it that doesn't change? Now, the, you know, I, I, I oftentimes will joke with people and do a kind of Buddhist question. Buddha said, everything changes. And then some people put up their head and then some people say, oh, this is a trick. The old monk is up to a trick. So is it true? Everything changes. Is that the Buddhist teaching? No, that's not what he taught. He said, that which has the nature to arise has the nature to cease. Now, why is that very, very different? Well, if everything changes, there would be nothing called the unconditioned, Nibbana. Then you wouldn't have a transcendent. You'd only have this endless flow of samsara. So does Buddhism say everything changes? Or does the Buddha say there is the unchanging, the unconditioned? And you will not find in the changing, obviously, the unconditioned, the unchanging. So then you, you, you take that language at, at, with curiosity, and then you put that into consciousness. Say, well, what's, what's unchanging? And then what do you get? I get silence. And then put the other question in. What's the, is there a center to awareness? Or is there a periphery? Same silence. You can go to the kitchen, <laughs> do that in the kitchen. Then do it with a toothache. That, that you don't have to get a toothache to do this, but should you get a toothache or pain in the hip? Well, what, is a, what is a presence or what is the way I do with pain? I say, well, what doesn't hurt? Now, having said that, I don't have some of the pains that my friends have. So I, you know, I, I, I'm not saying that I could do that. Hopefully I could, my practice would be there, but you, you like, what is, what is not angry in the midst of anger? What is not fearful in the midst of fear? And then it always takes you to silence knowing. And then you can't go further than that. So like with, with the, the sort of habits of, of emotion that I've suffered from and, and obviously, the first part was just somehow seeing this and not getting caught in the storyline and working, purifying the mind kind of over time. But then after a while, you realize it's, 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 it's to always be engaged with trying to fix fear or fix anger, or go to anger, I have to do something, or I have fear, I have to do something. Somehow, for a practitioner, that becomes, well, I, yeah, but it's still just an object. It's an emotionally unpleasant object. And I, I know how to refrain from hurting other people. So you, you become less interested in your own drama, in your own melodrama, right? Because you're more interested in, well, what is not a drama? What is not thought in the midst of thought? Is presence ever absent? This kind of 
curiosity. If I look, if I look at the Buddha Rupa and I make no comment about it, then the mind is silent. If I want the Buddha Rupa to be something, then the mind creates something. I don't like that Buddha. Someone didn't dust the table. It's too high, it's too low. And I get engaged with the object. I have to do that sometimes, much of the time. But also sometimes I, I think if we're going to aspire to a transcendent realization, we have to somehow disengage from the quality of objects. Now, if we can, how do you disengage from fear? Not dissociate, not, not go away from it. How do you do that? Well, you recognize it as a bodily feeling. But I, I, think, I think in the past, for me at least, I've gotten too caught up in trying to figure out fear through bodily awareness. But once I'm aware of fear as a bodily condition, I can ask myself, what is not fear? I mean, I have to work at that to get there because in the beginning, I didn't know how to do that because I was just so fearful and frightened and socially anxious. So I just had to kind of train myself to be aware, to be aware, to be aware until there was more strength around that. But then at some point, the whole investigation of emotions, the whole analysis of self, all of that begins to be tiresome. I suppose because one has more strength and awareness. And then you, you get this interesting kind of question come up, like what is not bored or, or what is not anxious? Which is different than you shouldn't be anxious or you've got, a, it's not even, it's not making a comment about the emotional object. What is it knows? Know the knowing. When you, when you are meditating or, or living your life, there come moments of interruption to the storylines and narratives of self, which are pretty rampant for most of us, I think. But the, the, there comes a point where you know what's going on. You know that you know. Now that to me is enlightenment, not the whole nine yards, the whole shebang, but it is the mind's enlightened to the way things are. And that moment must be treasured if one's going to really move towards that or incline towards that. If however, in that moment of awakening, there is immediately a judgment or there's no recognition of that awakening, then one falls back in to the forms of self that keep perpetuating themselves. So to know that you know means you're walking in the botanical garden at Ottawa and the trees are beautiful and it's all very lovely and you're worried about the email you sent. <laughs> and blah, 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 blah. And then all of a sudden you notice a cherry tree. And then, oh. And then you know that you know. Now rather than like, taking a picture of the cherry tree, you do that later, or, or getting heavy on yourself and you're thinking about that email trail again, you just say, oh, I know that I know. Knowing feels like this, you're on the path. That's the path. And, and you, re, you keep reaffirming that this is the path. And, and this is the moment. And then you don't really have to get anything. The habit is to get a thought, to take a picture, to get distracted or whatever, but to know that you know is a trusting awakening to the way things are. And then all the language that we have, well, for tomatoes, it's like this, know that you know, um, now is the knowing, puru, in Thai, all that makes a lot of sense. It's all the same thing. And for each of us, it's the same knowing because knowing doesn't have a national quality or it's not 75 years old or 32 years old. This is the beauty of it, this beauty of it. Once you, you, you trust in that, once you trust in that, then, then you'll find what, there's, there's, what happens is the aversion to thought falls away. Because I think as meditators, 
many of us have a, have a you know, kind of a vibhava tanha aversion to thought. So, and maybe many of us started with like really hardcore meditation techniques where we're kind of doing the meditation technique and trying to prevent the mind from thinking. So there, there can be among meditators this kind of backlog of negation of thought. So when thought comes up, oh, there it is again. Where's the doubt mind? Oh, oh, this kind of negativity. But once you once you take refuge in knowing and you really understand it, not just as a, a kind of verbal affirmation from culture, but you actually understand it, then that 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 resistance to thought is no longer there. It's just thought. And yeah, it babbles on a bit. So if you've been solving a problem, you'll have worried thoughts. If you've been creative, you have creative thoughts, but it's no longer. Uh, like like this this problem it's not a problem anymore. Now, certainly, if my thought patterns are driven by revenge and, and all kinds of things like that, yeah, it's a problem. You better not think that way. But most of us, I don't think there. I think most of us are are, are you know, we're very really committed to goodness. We're very really committed to non harm and 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 being decent people in the society. So I often say this. I don't. I, I wouldn't worry about anger, you know, don't, you know, like, don't make it a problem. I, I mean, don't hit anyone either. If you hit someone, then you, you better make it a problem. But for most of us, we don't hit people. We don't rob banks. Pretty honest, right? Very, very honest. So, so is anger really a problem? Anger is just anger. It just comes and goes. It's seeing it as it is, just like that. Right speech. Right action, human decency. Yes, if someone is not decent in their interpersonal relationships, then we call them on it. You can't do that. But assuming that we can now live in a way where we don't just dump our emotions on other people, is fear really a problem? Or is anger a problem? Or is doubt a problem? No, they're just some kairos. They come and they go. Don't make it a problem out of it. If you have refuge, but if you don't have refuge, if you don't, if you don't really have trust in knowing, knowing that you know, then the mind is always kind of going out there and trying to sort out these seeming problems. And, and if you have a good, strong, critical mind, then that becomes the, the kind of tyranny, the inner tyranny. It shouldn't be like this and on and on and on. It goes on and on and on. So rather than trying to get rid of thought, the, the idea of, oh, thinking feels like this. And then the mind is open. Thought comes and goes. Or, or you, you have, a, like, you get caught in a self-judgment kind of spin in your own mind. Oh, self-criticism feels like this. Trust in that. And then see, oh, yeah, there's the knowing. I know that I know. Now, Trusting in that is, is difficult because we want to do something. We want to become something. And quite often it's from a very good place. I want to become a better person. I don't want to be whatever it is. And, 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 and so the, 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 in, the, in, the in, where we're not capable of trust, we fall into doubt. Trust in what? Well, obviously trust in morality and so on, but trust in knowing that you know. And I find that I just keep coming back to that in my own practice. And then Lopo Semedos or Lopo Chas, and I keep reading that. It's so very, very simple. Our thought patterns are complicated. Sense consciousness is complicated. The needs we have in society, the, need, the things we have to do are complicated. And we have to live in that way. But is there also something actually very simple that we need to notice, which will then enhance our, 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 our kind of, cultural life and our social life, but it will, it will. Because once we get confidence in that, then we don't really need much. We don't, you don't really need much when you have that, that sense of trust and knowing. You need food and so on and so forth, and maybe you need to build a Dharma hole every now and then, but other than that, <laughs> there's not that much to do. And then that, then that sense of inner freedom and confidence just manifest as the Brahma Viharas. You want to give, you want to serve. 
you want to help, right? It's just the natural outcome of, of confidence in what the transcendent really is about. And then there's, I think, emerging that love and transcendence, all that language, which is very high language in all, all I think, all spiritual disciplines, the meaning of love becomes much more profound and awareness of how these are, yeah, maybe they're one or whatever. I don't want to lay, you know, these kind of definitions down because then one starts to look for those things. But compassion becomes something, um, obviously, very, 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 very natural to the heart because the heart doesn't want anything. Joy becomes very natural to the heart because the heart is available for joy. Uh, equanimity, equanimity, where does that come from? How does one find equanimity in watching the news? That's very hard. That's very, very hard. But equanimity is, is, is an acceptance from a loving place that life has this, has all of it. And, and that it is just as it is, which is not a statement of for or against. So if I read in BBC about the war in Ukraine, there's something in my desire mind, says, how could they do this? You know, how could they be, you know, it's not fair. And then I say, then I see the thoughts going there and they say, but it's like this. And then the heart is actually more open to the suffering of others. And, 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 and I'm careful, careful to put too much of that in, into my mind. So the heart can be open to the problems of life, but if I think I can solve all the problems of life or hate the, the people who perpetuate these things or, or who do it, then, then I'm caught in that. So to witness something which is very painful uh, in your own family or in your own heart or in your own history, and, and you feel something like, like let's say, um, you know, like with my mom, you know, I always talk about my mom and I have a few memories which come up where I, where I wasn't all that skillful. They're, they're really bad. They're, they can be very, very um, un, unhappy memories. And then what do I do with that? I so, say, oh, yeah, life is like this, that even, you know, anyone can make a mistake. Where I don't even go to that. Yeah, oh, yeah, too bad. That was painful. And I just recognize it. And the heart's open to it. Whereas if I go to thought and analysis, then that goes nowhere. So quite often, our, our ability to enter into the conflicts and pains of life with this openness uh, and, and bear witness to it is, is a very compassionate thing to do in our own hearts. And I realize sometimes, you know, people have huge problems, huge problems from family life or, or now with these different problems of, of uh, drug addictions and these kinds of things. These are, you know, these are kinds of things that re require more resources and more skills, skills that I, I, I don't have. But, but to actually feel the pain of the world or feel the pain of your family and realize, oh, I can't fix this. I, I mean, I can't, I, can't, I can't rectify this. I can feel that. And to actually be with that just as it is, to me, seems an opening to compassion. It's compassion. Um, but as soon as I try to fix it or move away from it, move away from that pain, then of course it's no longer compassion. It's whatever it is, whatever it is. And that to me is what, uh, when we talk about upeka, the kind of peacefulness with the way things are, it's a loving peacefulness. It's a painful peacefulness, I would say. And it can be very, very painful, but it's peaceful coexistence with the way things are. Because one has confidence in, it's like this, know that you know, that's the real home. Okay, I'll uh, leave that there.